Hello there, and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room where we are continuing on with the Mandragora project. That's right, it's a Christmas miracle. I finally got most of the bodice together and finished. It's not 100% done. You'll see what I mean when we get to the beading later because the work that I'm doing on this just takes hours and hours, and after another day full of beading yesterday, I still wasn't quite done. But I think I have enough of it done that you can get the idea of what I'm going for. But of course, before I could start beading or embellishing anything, I had to go ahead and construct the bodice proper. So let's go ahead and jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. Yes, that's right. No pattern drafting today. We got it all out of the way last time with the mock-up. This is close enough for me. I could spend some time perfecting this at the shoulder, but because of all of the embellishing I plan on doing, it won't really be noticeable anyhow that there's a couple of little wiggles up there, so we're just gonna go with it, because sometimes close enough is good enough. I'm sorry, I really am. Um, you know, luckily, we have so much embellishing to do on this later. Trust me, it'll be fine. So here I am cutting out of the Mandragora silk, and then I did also cut a layer of interlining out of silk organza in black here, for my sleeve puffs. Uh, I only used the organza on the sleeve puff here, and the organza is extremely stiff. Um, it's like the same sheerness as a silk chiffon, but the opposite end of the spectrum. This is very stiff stuff. Um, so I'm going to use this to line my sleeve puffs for this, and I'm going to use the same size sleeve puff, but I'm going to attach them at the higher level um, on this one, so it'll be a bit of a shorter sleeve than the last mock-up I made, the black version, but the same amount of fabric is going into that same sleeve, even though it will be a little bit shorter, so it still will be giant and puffy, I promise. And then, of course, I have to interline everything else, so for the main body of this, I'm interlining it in black muslin, just like I usually do for my costumes here on the channel, if you've seen me make anything else. I will put a playlist up to the all the costuming videos I've done so far on this channel, if you'd like to see me do any more costuming, if you are perhaps new here. Um, I haven't been doing costuming very long, well, I say that. I've been doing costuming since I was about 12, <laughs> technically. Um, but I took a break from historic costuming because I just couldn't really afford to do it uh, for a while there. And now, thanks to my patrons, I'm able to make amazing, ridiculous nonsense like this and play with these fun fabrics. So thank you again to all of you for supporting me and making projects like this possible and making this my job, which is really remarkable, honestly. And I have way too much fun with it, even if I don't schedule myself very well. I am my own boss these days, but my boss can be kind of demanding, weirdly enough. But here I am just pinning all the Mandragora silk layer to the black muslin layer, uh, gently within the seam allowances, basically, with my silk pins here so that nothing gets snagged or sad. And then I will go ahead and use cotton thread to baste all of these pieces together around the edges before I sew them together, so, so that I can do that. And I did have a few questions um, from people... Sorry, I haven't gotten to answer all my comments yet. Um, on what color of silk this is from Silk Baron, and it's called Mandragora. So on their website, this is the Mandragora Silk Taffeta. Um, I named the gown after the color of silk just because it was so fitting already. Um, so this is the Mandragora Silk from Silk Baron. I think they still have it in stock, although I think I bought the last of this roll because I did end up buying another three yards after I started playing with this because I was like, okay, we're definitely making an evening bodice and I kind of want to make myself something else out of this uh, fabric. And luckily, I think I will have left enough left over to do so. So I bought another three yards of this, and it was actually, they let me know it was the end of the bolt, and it was in two pieces, and would I mind, and blah, blah, blah. But I did not mind. I just wanted more of this silk in my life, because it is literally delicious. So, you know. But here I am using a beading needle and a piece of waxed cotton thread, again in white, um, to do all my basting on this. I like to do my basting, stitching, and whip stitching in white just so that the inside looks very Frankenstein-tastic, and I can see all of those stitches I put in because it makes me feel like I have accomplished something if I can see them, weirdly enough. Um, and it is obviously better for cameras, so you can see what I'm doing. But for the very fronts of these, you do base them a little bit different, and that is because you are gonna like flatline, or not flatline, you're going to bag line, I guess, the front. Um, you do so right sides together of the very center front of a bodice like this one, and then turn those uh, wrong sides together and then flatline the rest of it, um, basting around the edges. So. Here I'm just lining the very center front. Hopefully that makes any sense. If you've seen my cicada videos, then you know what I mean. I did forget to do this on the last mock-up, so I was making extra care that I did it this time because I remember I basted the whole front last time and then not, oh. And then I had to put a facing along the center front of the black mock-up. So, you know, that wasn't fun uh, to realize at least. It was an easy enough fix, but when you're already behind, any adding of time onto things hurts. But of course, this center front seam here is curved, so I will have to clip that before I can press this into place. 
but I'll go ahead and do that. I could actually have done edge stitching here as well too, or under stitching rather, um, to help this along. The center front of this will be covered by the embellishment and the plastron in the front, the sort of like stomacher-ish thing that I'm going to sew on here later. So I'm not super concerned if there's visible stitching or anything going on down the center front because it will be covered in the end. Um, it does look nice plain. Like before I started embellishing this, I did like it all simple and plain, but they didn't leave a lot of things simple and plain and unembellished in the 1890s either. So I don't feel bad piling on the stuff later, but now I can go ahead and flatline the rest of this or based around the edges so that this will be nice and flatlined and ready to go. But that center front edge is now finished. And again, you can see I'm just kind of loosely basting this with large uneven stitches within the seam allowance with cotton thread. This is just to keep everything smooth later on and try and avoid as many wrinkles as possible. Although with taffeta, it's not exactly possible to get a perfectly smooth finish. And they certainly didn't back in the Victorian era either. And it's nice in an iridescent silk, honestly, to have some folds and creases because then it shows the iridescence of the fabric. And it's the kind of thing I really appreciate in like old portrait painting as well, seeing the folds of silk and the different colors. So, you know, it's part of the allure of silk taffeta, I think is that it's not perfectly smooth, really. And I'm just going all the way around here. I think the general recommendation, am I not, look at my thread still tangling even though it's waxed. Can you not, please? We have many pieces to base, let's go. Um, but I think the general recommendation is to not do the waist in the neck, but I did it anyway. So, you know, sometimes we have to make our own rules in life and especially in sewing. And I'm going to just trim the excess here just because that front is curved uh, over just a little bit. This ends up with the inner lining being a little bit larger than the silk layer, so I'm just gonna trim that off. But now that my front pieces are all completely interlined, I can go ahead and transfer over my dart markings from the Truly Victorian pattern onto this back here, so I can sew in my darts for this. They are quite short because I've made this bodice end at the waist as opposed to come down past the waist. So these darts are no biggie here on the front, although this shot is a little bit blown out. And actually, <laughs> speaking of cameras, you may notice that a lot of the footage of this video is not, it's a little bit crunchier than usual and it's not what it's not the best and that is because uh about this time <clears throat> in this evening when i was working on this the camera just my dslr my trusty decade-old dslr slid right off the top of the tripod it wasn't connected fully in landed awkwardly on the floor and the back of the screen cracked and it didn't turn on anymore and it was broken so that's exactly what you want while you're working on a prog uh, project that you're behind on at 11.30 p.m. while you're sewing is to have your DSLR completely break. Um, so that was an unexpected business expense this last week. I have purchased a new Nikon for use down here. I eventually do need to upgrade to like a proper YouTuber camera, but until then I needed something that I could, that I was familiar enough with. So I just kind of went with the current model of the same camera that I had destroyed. <clears throat> So you'll notice here, if you look closely, the footage is, again, very crunchy. There's lots of dead pixels in this old sensor because I'm using my oldest camera that I had around because I, you know, just because the camera broke didn't mean I could stop sewing. I had to keep, keep going. So I pulled out my older camera and was using that. So now we have, it's not a full HD experience. Let's just, let's just say, um, we're going to, we're going to pretend it's part of the antique vibes. <clears throat> that the digital camera sensor has so many pixels out and stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah, that's, it's the vintage vibe. But here I am sewing my darts, you know, starting at the large end of the dart and sewing off the tip of the point and tying the point shut, just like I do for modern darts, even though these ones are a little bit curvier and funny. I am just following the truly Victorian pattern quite closely here for the um, shape of the pattern in the darts and stuff like that, because it fit me so well right out of the bag. And that's why I love me some truly Victorian. I don't know what they're doing over there, but their sizing is better than most other pattern companies I've ever tried. So that's nice. But with my darts sewn, I can take this over onto the ironing board here and I'm going to slice down the middle of my darts in the back here as far as I can up towards the points, but not all the way to the tiny tibby point. And then I will press those open and then I'm going to whip stitch this raw uh, like seam allowance in here, I guess, dart allowance, yeah. Um, dart fullness that has been sliced open here. I will go ahead and whip stitch that again with the same waxed white cotton thread just so none of this frays. I will eventually be boning this area as well, but one thing at a time. But uh, I am excited to get to play around with that new camera. I have not yet. It arrived a day ago and I've been work working on this video. So alas, I have not played with a new camera yet, um, but hopefully I can get it figured out so that from now on we can have 
less, or, or we can have tastier footage, as it were. Uh, we'll see. I didn't go for the 4K model. I hope you can forgive me. I figure HD is enough. I'm not shooting any Aurora Borealis or, you know, epic, I don't know, nature photography anytime soon, sadly enough. My mom picked me up these cute little gothic scissors, aren't they fun? I was glad because I'm missing one of my pairs down here, so this is the this is now the pair that live over here on the in the ironing station. I try to have a small pair of little embroidery scissors at each of the places I usually sit down or stand here in my sewing room because I'm always forgetting to bring my scissors with me. I have several pairs. It's my solution to that. But here I'm just using that same beading needle, going ahead and whip stitching all this, like so. It is very fun to work on this project because it's fun to look at this color of silk. Of course, I do have my green LEDs on most of the time in here that makes it make it shine even more. And it makes me wish that Silk Baron or somebody had olive green and Kelly green iridescent silk. And if you've ever seen such a thing, like if you've ever seen shot silk that is like Kelly green one way and like a yellow green the other way, do let me know. Feel free to link that below because all colors of green silk, you know, live rent free in my mind as the youth would say, I, I think. <clears throat> I don't really know. I'm very old, you know? What, what are you gonna do? But once I have this whip stitching finished up, I can start to work on some of the other pieces around the bodice here. I have all my basting done and I can start sewing these bits together. So this is the one of the center back pieces and one of the side back pieces. Of course, this has a bit of a princess seam back here. So I have to curve, uh, do a concave and a convex curve together. I always like to do this with the straight piece on the top normally. Well, there you go. I just find that easier as for pinning these things. So I'm just pinning this again with my fine silk pins. I did end up getting some more of these when I was out looking for velvet ribbon at the Joann's. As we know, I was recently doing a little bit of velvet ribbon crap, velvet ribbon crafting here on the channel. Um, again, procrastinating this project with those other DIYs because uh, I procrastinate creating things by creating other things. Um, those are just the facts. And I use my entire life to procrastinate writing somehow, even though writing is my favorite thing to do of all, honestly. As fun as costuming and beading and making beaded beetles and doing all my other creative endeavors is. Writing is my favorite of all, which means I should really take some time to do it sometime soon. <laughs> and you can see, I'm not exactly happy with the distribution there, so I took all the pins back out and started over because I'm just trying to ease this, these two curves together. And so if it takes me more than one try, it takes me more than one try, you know? I last, I'm not perfect, which is obviously a bummer, but what are you gonna do? All right, that's better feels better already. And I'll do this for both of the backs and side backs and set those next to the machine. All right, so back over on the 99K, of course, I'm just using a half inch seam allowance as usual for me. I'm just gonna sew these together with like a 12 stitch length. I believe that's 12, 12 st stitches, 12 stitches per inch on my machine. Stitches per inch is not easy to say. The word stitches for some reason really stitches me up for some reason, I can't say it. But I'll sew both of those seams and then I will take everything back on over to the ironing board and we will whip stitch all of this raw edge and stuff inside as well. Um, often in historic garments, you will see it uh, pinked or bound in like a silk or like early rayon binding, um, depending on the era of the dress in question. Um, but often these were stitched as well. The finer garments you see it bound uh, in like a silk binding kind of cord or not cord, but um, like thin, 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 thin ribbon. Um, but alas, I'm just going to whip stitch mine because it works. It is very cheap because the cost of thread is not high compared to the cost of silk binding, that's for sure. I don't even know where you would find silk seam binding. If you know, do let me know a source because it could be fun to have for something luxurious in the future. But here I've trimmed this or uh, clipped the seam down to the seam because we need of course, those curved edges to lay nice and smooth or as smooth as possible. And then I will go ahead and whip stitch all this. Actually, I end up sewing the next panel on before I remember to whip stitch. So I was like jumping ahead, but we'll get back in here in a moment. But here I am pinning the side to the side back now on one side of this. I think in the Truly Victorian instructions, which I did not read for this, sorry, uh, they have you stitch the center back last. At least that's how it was for the 1880s bodice, I think. And I don't know why I was following that, but I was, you know, here we are. I'll do the other side the same, of course. I like to batch process, as I always say. So I like to pin as much as I can, set it next to the machine, sew as much as I can, and go back and forth from these two stations here in my sewing room. Luckily, it's actually not too difficult to construct a bodice like this one. It's just tedious because of all the hand finishing, I suppose. Um, it's not necessarily hard to fit together, weirdly enough. 
And, until we get to the sleeves, of course, but <laughs> that's, we'll get there eventually, but not right now. Especially the waist, it's very important to clip here. You can see that I'm doing that. Um, and we have our little points for like the back skirt of this that you'll see come together. But it is mostly straight lines and right angles for this skirt, which is nice. A little peplum of it, I guess, in the back. Do the other side just the same here. Isn't this silk so fun? My goodness. It is slightly ribbed, so it is making the camera react even more poorly to it because um, things that like, are super fine stripes or super fine plaids usually make a camera go a little bit nuts, which is what this is doing occasionally. But it's very fun silk. I feel so lucky to have been using it and still have some left. Um, it's just gorgeous. I love, I love green, as we know. But now that I have these six pieces sewn together, um, I will go ahead and start whip stitching those seams since I was like, oh shoot, you need to start whip stitching girl before things start fraying on you because that's the thing about silk, it does want to fray. So not too bad, not compared to like, like the organza or the chiffon I'll use later. Those really want to fray, but this taffeta is not too bad. At least it has some stability going on. But I will go ahead and whip stitch all of these seams that I've just cut open and pressed flat, um, gently here. Um, just so that things don't fray. And I think you can space this whip stitching out quite a lot, bit further, but like I just get in a groove and keep going. Um, so my stitches are about mm, maybe a little under half inch apart, like a third of an inch, if that's a thing. No fractions, please. Americans in their imperial measurements, I know. What's the deal? But all the way along here, I will do the same for every single cut seam. Look how many pairs of scissors are in the top corner again. I think there are three pairs up there. Oh my. Um, so now I have this modern plastic wriggle and boning. That's right. Too bad. We're using it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and make casings out of bias strips of my black muslin here. And I'm going to do those custom fit for each piece that I cut over here. So here I'm going to cut a piece of boning that is a little bit shorter than I need over here just because I don't want this poking me in the underarm. So I have about a half inch well, a little bit under that. I've had a quarter inch of buffer at the top of this as well. And then I need to leave a half inch free at the bottom for when I sew binding off to that bottom edge. So I am leaving this a little bit free. Um, some of the bodices I've seen have boning all the way like to the top of the bodice, like even in the back. And some of them I've seen with really short pieces of boning in here, but most 1890s bodices, most Victorian bodices in general, have boning in them, despite the fact that they are worn over a fully boned corset, of course. Um, there's boning in the bodice as well. It just helps keep the structure of the garment and the intended silhouette. So I'm going to go ahead and use these little strips of fabric. Again, this is just cut on the 45 degree angle. This is bias cut strips. I don't think it needs to be bias. It could be regular as well. Or you could use seam binding or twill tape to do this kind of thing. I thought muslin would be nice and thin, so it wouldn't add too much bulk. Um, so I'm just making these little casings for my boning pieces. But once I have those encased, I'm actually just, uh, I trimmed one edge of the seam allowance and then left the other at a half inch like that. And I'm just turning that seam allowance underneath the bone here to protect the silk even further from this plastic wriggling. And I'm pinning this into place loosely here. And then I'm going to, I guess, fell, or like kind of the difference between felling and whip stitching, a thin one, um, whip these down to just the seam allowance. So I'm not sewing this to anything but the seam allowance in here. It just seems to be how it was done at the time and therefore how I will do it as well. And speaking of uh, stitch density, as it were, if you look inside old 1890s bodices, and I will link to my Pinterest board below where you can look at my references that I've been looking at the inside of bodices because there are a lot of resellers that sell antique garments that do a good job of documenting the inside, which is nice. Better than museums do at least. So you can see what the inside of these things, these things actually looks like. Um, but sometimes you'll see boning sewn in really loosely. It'll have like eight tacks up the uh, entire length of the bone. And it's like, okay, well, really stitched those in there quick and quick and easy, didn't they? But again, I go about every half inch, perhaps. I just grab a little bit of the seam allowance and grab a little bit of the bone casing here and go all the way along. And you will see sometimes that these are, um, what is it called? Flossed the same way that a bone for a corset would be. Also my thread broke here because I was using cotton thread. And so I just switched to poly thread because I pulled too hard on it. And I usually break the cotton thread in here. So I switched to polyester thread. I am using yellow for this just because I thought it would look interesting. That's right. Listen, I have to stare at the inside of the garment for hours and hours and hours. So sometimes I want to use a funny color thread. No one will ever see it. It's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, sometimes these, I have seen them be flossed as well. So the bones won't move around. People have been telling me that they have seen steel boning and things like this, but I have an 1890s bodice that is like in my collection 
And it's not a shirtwaist, it's, it's like a bodice, and I don't think it's boned at all, which is weird. So like, apparently that which I didn't think was possible is possible, and perhaps steel boning in these things is possible. So use whatever you want, honestly. If you're making a costume, it's down to you what you want to do. Nobody from the 1890s is going to come back and haunt you about it. I promise. Well, I don't promise. Who knows? I can't, I can't promise that kind of thing, I guess. I do like stitching in one direction more than the other, so you see I just turn the entire garment around so that I can keep stitching in my groove as well. So I've just turned the entire garment so that I can stitch down the other side, just whipping slash felling, whatever this is, the boning down to that seam allowance, pinching it in my fingers. This is kind of the more, one of the more hard parts of this, boning the whole thing, just because it's a little bit more strenuous, like pinching and holding everything into place um, properly. So it's a little bit harder on the hands. And my hands are a little bit destroyed right now just from all of this sewing and all of the beating I'm about to do. And the fact that it's winter and winter in Colorado is a dry time. So my hands are a very dry right now. I went to Lush, actually. I was out Christmas shopping with my mom and I was like, can we pop into this Lush because I need to get some serious hand cream going because my hands are gonna crack apart. We can't have that. We have things to do. And I do need to bone the darts here in the front as well. So these are a little shorter pieces here. I just make these about three quarters of an inch shorter than the actual dart itself. Again, sometimes I've seen them longer, sometimes I see them shorter. Most of the time they seem to be about the length of the dart. Um, and the nice thing about having this boning in this cotton casing is it gives me plenty to like sew into, which is nice. But again, I just flip the whole garment around and sew down the other side as well. Kind of have a full stitch across the top like that to hold it in place, and like so. And then the entire inside of the bodice is boned. Hooray, like so. Now I need to line this bottom skirt portion, or basically finish the bottom edge of the bodice in general. So for the back pemblum area, I have traced copies of the back of my pattern pieces of the uh, side, the side back, and the back itself. I've just traced about two inches above the waist down to the hem on each of those. And then of course I needed another piece of my Dracula collar, as I was calling it last time, here as well, in a contrast silk. And I originally thought about using yellow because part of this weave is yellow and so they actually match quite well together. But I think I want to save this yellow silk to try and make a like sash belt for this gown as like a fun like pop belt or maybe even a, with a bow. And so I was trying to think of another color that would go with this and I ended up getting a yard of what was the closest thing they had to black at the time at Silk Baron, which is this sort of graphite color. I'll put the name of the color of silk, I'll link to it below, but it's this kind of grayed or like graphite sort of black taffeta. And I think it works well with this mandragora silk. The mandragora has three colors of thread that make up the iridescence um, that make up the olive green, this mix. There's sort of a mauve kind of grayed out brown and then a yellow and a black thread woven together to create the iridescent olive green silk. So because there is a black thread in there and this kind of grayish mauve thread, this color of black silk taffeta uh, pairs quite well with it because in some lights the mandragora silk looks almost like a gray, has a grayish tinge to it. And so this grayish black, I felt worked well with it. Um, I kind of don't l necessarily like things to be too, too contrasty. I almost feel like it makes it look less, I mean, I say less accurate. They have plenty of weird color combinations and contrast going on in 1890s garments. Anytime anyone wants to be like, oh, they wouldn't have done it that way. I feel like I always find an example of someone doing it that way. So like in the past, I mean, so never let anyone tell you, oh, they never would have done that. So what? We're living in 20. 22 practically so you know <laughs> we can do whatever we want um but i just think that the black blended in quite well especially because i was going to be doing mostly black embellishments on this i'm just trying to justify not using the yellow because i know some people are going to want me to have you used a higher contrast you do you i'll do me okay i'm just going to make it graphite but i have all these pieces cut out now and i can sew them all together so that i can line the bottom portion of my project so back over here on the machine Sewing these pieces together, again, half inch seam allowance as usual, just the same. Um, these don't need to be flat lined or anything, which is nice. They don't even need to be interfaced. They can just be nice and crispy in there. Just gonna provide a little lining to finish off the bottom skirt of this whole thing. I like lining the peplum -y bits in the back on Victorian bodices in general. Um, a lot of Victorian garments are not fully lined. I mean, it's actually very rare for them to be fully lined, I should say. Most of the time the insides are left exposed. Um, which is why there's all that whip stitching or binding and different ways to finish it. I'm just going to sew my collar together while I'm here as well. Just two layers of that mandragora silk, just like I did for the mock-up version, honestly. It is a little bit more irritating to sew down here in my basement sewing room in the wintertime because of one particular issue, and that is that I cannot have the iron 
plugged in at the same time as my space heater. So I, I can be warm or the iron can be warm, but not both. Because if I plug in both at the same time, I will trip my circuit down here. And then I have to go outside and reset the circuit and it's cold outside. So I really have to be careful when sewing in winter. And a lot of times I just, if I have to have the iron on, I have to be kind of cold, which is why I, you know, make house coats sometimes, but it can be irritating to sew while wearing that much fabric. So sadly, sometimes I just am chilly, which I suppose is a historic experience because I assume when people were making garments in the past, there wasn't central heating either, but at least they had fireplaces, which man, would I love a fireplace in my studio? Wow. That would be really cool. Once again, I had to clip the waist and any curves on these but then I can go ahead and iron all the seams flat on this before I use it to line the back peplum portion of my bodice. So just pressing that over here like so, and I can start pinning it here. And you can see like how these angles are not too acute, which makes it easier to poke these uh, corners out later once it's sewn, which is nice. So it's almost nice that this particular design doesn't require super pointy Dracula ripping back here, as I like to call it. But with that all wrangled and pinned in place, I can bring it over to here to the machine and start stitching this down. I should have left myself a half inch open at the top of this, which I just have to fiddle with and remedy later. So important to remember, leave yourself a half inch open at the top where this attaches to the rest of the skirt <laughs> or the rest of the um, bodice. Dang it. But you know, the rest of this half inch seam allowance, always leaving the needle down when I reach a point, turning the project and then putting the press foot back down and keep going. As you can see, as I go around here, that's the method I'm using. It's what I always use to get around corners or little fiddly bits. Leave the needle down, turn the project, keep going, etc., etc. Making sure all my seams that are open like that, that are pinned open, are not getting catched in any way, hopefully. Every once in a while I'll catch one and then I get really sad. But if you take your time, that won't happen to you. This front, well, this frontmost piece is a little bit curved. But like right here at the very top of this area where this attaches to where there will need to be binding to him the rest of this, I should have left a half inch open. I forget every time. <laughs> I think I forgot last time too. Oh well. Just means I have to cut and fix it a little bit once I put the binding on. But here I am clipping my corners and any curves or uh, anything like that so that this will lay again, at least mostly smooth. And then I can turn this right sides out so that I have this lovely graphite black lining for my peplum back here. And it will show a little bit in the end. So it's important to have this be just as pretty as the outside, I suppose. So I'm just gonna fiddle with the corners here and make sure this all can be ironed nice and smooth. With that all finished, I'm just going to turn the top of this under a half inch and start pinning it down to the boning. I'm going to kind of hem this and then wherever it crosses over a boning channel, I will do a couple of stitches to secure it to the boning channel. I don't want to hem it down, down directly to the interlining just because I want it to hang free a little bit in here, just in case anything wants to pull funny from the outside. I'd rather it just be kind of free hanging in here because it doesn't really matter and it will avoid complications, I suppose. But now that I have this all lined, I can start uh, like folding this the way I like and then pressing it. So I was like, okay, how does this go again? <laughs> Coming in here and just kind of giving this a good press. I ended up actually turning my iron up a little bit. I'm always careful when I'm ironing silk. Don't want pressing marks, but I wanted to turn it up just a little bit so I could have a tiny bit of steam and really set these little pleats in place back here. But I'm not doing this, you know, I'm doing this by eye. I'm just kind of figuring out a pattern, a placement that I like back here. I think it's a little bit folded a tiny bit different than I folded the last one, but this, the effect is similar, you know? My little pointy bits back here, little bat wing pointy-ish shapes. I actually made the, I added lapels to this design you'll see later um, in the front of my plastron that actually a little bit bat wing shaped again as well. As many spider webs and bat influences and bugs as I can pile onto things, I just want to be the queen of Halloween, you know? I don't care what time of year it is. Halloween is year round in my brain. I don't care what time of year it is. All right, now that everything is playing nicely, I can go ahead and before I stitch everything down inside, I just want to go ahead and do the rest of the things I'll have to stitch down inside, which is this bias tape to finish the bottom edge of the front of the bodice. So I've just cut this again on the 45 degree angle strips from a scrap piece of my mandragora silk. And I've just cut that at two inches wide, again on the 45, 
and I will sew this onto the outside at a half inch and then fold it all onto the inside so this is a nice clean finished bottom edge to this bodice in the front. Um, most 1890s bodices I was looking at, it seemed like most of them have a subtly pointed past the waist front. Not a very like, deep pointed front, which is something that was more common in the 1880s, funny enough. But uh, I wanted it to finish straight across. And then I was thinking about wearing this with like different bows or sash belts and sash buckles and things like that. So that's why I wanted to kind of just finish this straight across across the front. I did see some examples like this from the 1890s. Again, check out my Pinterest board to see where what was floating in my mind while I was designing and working on this situation. I'm just going to fold everything smooth onto the inside here and again, press it into submission. And then once this is all smooth, I can go ahead and fell this down to the interlining and then tack down the skirt lining in the back. The peplum lining. I keep wanting to say skirt. A very short skirt. It would not cover anything. But it would be a fun circus costume just to wear this with a leotard. Not that I require a circus costume ever. And here's where I should have left myself a little bit of room and ended up having to make a little slice and really wrangle things in there uh, where these two bits meet. So just leave yourself that half inch and you won't have to deal with this. Oh, you've blocked yourself, Esposito. Look what you've done. That's right. Now you have to make a little cut into things and then really get fiddly, fiddly in here. Lovely. What am I up to? I forget every time. I can't do, you know, remember every step of the process, I suppose. But with everything tucked and ready, I can go ahead and stitch this all down. I am just using black silk thread for this because every once in a while I decide to be fancy. I don't know why. <laughs> Again, as usual, when I come to do the voiceover later after I've made this project, I can't always explain why I choose to do the things I do. And sometimes it's late at night, as we know, and your camera's just broken and you're really having a weird mental space of thinking about how much money you're going to have to spend that you weren't planning on spending. Thank you, patrons, again, for making it so that when I break my camera, I don't have to freak out and that I can keep working because I know, thanks to you, that I can get a new camera and I can keep working. Whew. I'm very, very lucky. But here I am stitching that little area that I had to make a little cut. Ah. Just make sure everything is nice in here and really secure. Again, that's kind of the nice thing about the black silk thread. It's super thin and it kind of disappears into both colors of these silks. So no worries. No one will ever know. Once again, one of those things where it's like, if you're noticing that I have a couple extra stitches at this point, you are really too close to me, especially during a plague. But again, I will just kind of whip stitch the top of this folded over. Um, just so it's like slightly hemmed and then I will tack it down to the seam allowance and the boning whenever I intersect with one of those channels and then just keep hemming from there in between. Um, just gives my lining in here a little bit of flexibility. It doesn't need to be sewn down to the inner lining so I didn't. I feel like getting the I feel like getting the placement of this like lining on the inner lining perfect would be hard so I'm just not gonna bother with it. Why not? Once again no one else is inside my bodice but me and you. <laughs> but now that I have all the boning and the bottom finish, I can finally sew my shoulder seams together because it just seems easier to do all that while everything's still flat and not like a full garment. But now that that's all done, I can go ahead and sew my shoulder seams together. They're slightly curved on these Victorian garments. This one's a little bit less curved than the 1880s bodice was. But I can go ahead and sew these together. Again, these shoulder seams could use a little bit more finessing in my pattern, but meh. Meh. Everyone's looking at the giant puppy sleeves anyhow, right? That's right. So go ahead and sew that real fast and I'm going to press these open. I'm actually not going to clip these because the curve is subtle enough, um, but I will whip stitch each of these raw edges as well so that they do not fray, as you can see they already want to do. So I'm just going to go ahead and whip stitch that just like I did for the main body of the bodice as well. And now it is finally time to start putting on my collars. So I made this little Dracula collar the same way I did in the last time. Again, I'll have a link in the cards to the mock-up for this bodice, where I figured out a lot of the details I wanted to do and pattern drafted this stuff. So you can see that in the last video. This one just gets sandwiched in between the bodice and the actual stand collar. So this just gets pinned to the center back along the back neck here, like so. And then um, I can go ahead and pin the other collar over it. Again, I'm going to pin only one side of this other collar down because I will use the inside as a way to finish this up cleanly on the inside of the neck. I finally remember how to do stand collars because I've made so many of them this year. <laughs> I used to be that I would do them so rarely that I would be like, how do I put this back on? Because it had been years since I'd done one. But now I do one every couple of months, at least. I've been making a lot of 
shirts this year um, that I was wearing out on my adventures. So I've got a lot of stand color experience now and they don't intimidate me anymore, which is quite nice actually. And now that I know how to put these little Dracula colors in between, pff, wanna add them to everything. Is it bad to just have like ridiculous villain stand collars on like normal clothes? Should I just make a dress that has this like villain collar and wear it about? It's an idea, you know. Am I eccentric enough? <laughs> Should we add villain collars to the situation? I mean, now that I have my villain hair, it's just my final form, you know? I, 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 it turns out I needed this blonde streak from the start. We're still getting it blonde enough, but one day I'll just have this white streak of hair and it will be very exciting. But now that that is all sewn on, I again clipped that neckline seam in here because it is curved and I can fold everything nice and smooth and cover all that lettuce up in here. Just how I always do stand colors. So one side down and then use the inside edge to encompass everything and encase everything up inside. So just press all the seam allowance up after you've got it clipped, of course. This is a very curvy edge, but once this is all pinned down in here, I will go ahead and fell this little edge down as well. You could slip stitch it if you really wanted to have a seamless, you know, very flawless finish, but I see no, re I see no reason to not just fell it. I think felling is a little bit faster than slip stitching. So for historic costuming, felling seems perfectly accurate and serviceable, honestly. So just taking small stitches, going along here. Of course, I'm only stitching through the interlining again so that none of these stitches will show on the outside, even though this area will be covered with beads <laughs> later. So it really wouldn't matter, but that's all right. And then now that I have all of the bodice pretty much constructed, unfortunately it's time to set in the sleeves, which means I have to construct them. So here I have my undersleeve and top part of the sleeve is a two-part sleeve for these. Well, it's a three-part sleeve if we count the puff. Um, so I'm just stitching those together. Again, half inch seam allowance. You can see I actually pre-whip stitched the raw edges of these. I just find that easier for the sleeves. And I don't actually clip the curves of these seams. Maybe I should, but I don't. Again, the more subtle the curve, the more likely I am to be able to get away with not cur cur uh, clipping it. Um, I know I don't have to because of experience on this, not because I don't normally clip curves because I normally do. I need to throw in my two lines of gathering stitching along the regular sleeve here. Also, I hemmed these with a bit of bias tape. Didn't show you that. I'm sure I've showed that here on the channel before, but I just hemmed the sleeves with bias the same way I finished the bottom of the bodice, honestly. And I have my interlined sleeve puffs here with that organza, which is really doing a nice moire, moire effect with the camera. There's moire fabric, and then there's the effect that is caused by uh, distortion in the camera when it can't sense two patterns overlaying like that, which is also called moiré because it has the same sort of effect. Anyhow, <laughs> over here, putting my two lines of gathering stitching in on the machine, just my largest stitch length, of course, and the top of the sleeve puff here. And then I need to put gathering stitching along the bottom of the big sleeve puff and the top of the big sleeve puff as well. And they will all get sewn together shortly. It's a lot of gathering that has to be done just now. Ooh. Oh, well. It's actually the nice thing about gathering though, is that it does hide mistakes. So like setting the sleeve in, if it wasn't perfect, you really cannot tell because it's all just puff anyhow. So as long as there's puff there, you, you did great. Um, but here I'm sewing the side seams of my sleeve puffs, like so, and I will, of course, press those open. I don't have to whip stitch them because they'll be entirely encased inside. Love that. I mean, I could if I was being, wow, incredibly thorough. But again, this garment is not gonna get a ton of use. And so I'm not worried about it coming apart really. So once I put my gathering lines of stitching in, um, again, always two lines of gathering stitching. In case one breaks, you'll be happy you have two, believe me. And it is easier to gather down with two lines of stitching. I can gather the uh, straight edge, like the bottom edge of this, down, 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 until it fits the sleeve, basically. And I have marked on my sleeves with tracing paper, like I was marking the uh, darts earlier. I marked where the line to attach these is. I forgot to take a clip of that, but again, I think it I showed in the last video, so you can see me doing that. Um, just mark where they're supposed to be according to the truly Victorian pattern is what I did. Um, but you can put the level of the sleeve anywhere you want. You can put it down at the elbow or you can put it higher. Depends on what effect you're going for. Again, the sleeves this time I'm setting them uh, a little bit higher here so that the puff is really concentrated up towards the top of the shoulder. Giant sleeve puff situation. I considered uh, stuffing these sleeves with like some sort of uh, sleeve support as well. But it turns out the organza, I think, does a pretty dang good job of supporting these sleeves. Uh, I think if they were any puffier, it would almost be too ridiculous. I'm sure the, you know, Edwardian cusp late Victorian people would love it, but honestly, they're puffy enough. They, and like the, 
Organza holds its shape so well, it's just like they seem like a pillow, and then you just press them and they deflate. Which would be good for fitting into a carriage and such, I suppose. As opposed to having little tiny bustles in your sleeves, which they totally did. So if you want to stuff your sleeves with stuff, feel free to, because it was definitely a thing. But here I am just figuring out how to pin all that gathering down around the sleeve. Uh, you can see here that I have the sleeve cap on the left-hand side of the screen. And so I'm stitching this down right sides together with the top of the sleeve puff cap facing the wrist. Hopefully this makes sense. They do explain this in the Truly Victorian pattern. So if you have, or you're using this same kind of pattern, you would see how to do this in their instructions as well. Um, or I think I showed how to do it in my last video. I don't know. I probably just talked about suffering through all this gathering, which factual. And you can see how much this silk wants to fray because it's all coming apart here as I wrestle with this. And we're just fitting this down, spacing the gathers out if I have to. It's pretty much just like as much as it can be gathered is how it is gathered. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, math going on here. <laughs> I just gathered it down as much as I could, and that seemed to fit pretty well onto the sleeve itself. So I'm just putting this in place, and then sewing this is really irritating on my machine because I don't have, like, a removable bit to the end of my machine. Like, a lot of machines now, you have, like, a piece you can remove down here so you can get into smaller spaces, but on this old Singer 99K, I do not, so I just have to really be careful that I'm not sewing down anything on accident underneath all this. So here I am, really wrestling with that, and this is sped up. I am taking my time. You're watching this at two and a half times speed. It took me a little bit longer to make sure that nothing was caught underneath, as you can see. Okay, so now I have the puff sleeve flipped up so that both sleeve caps can be aligned. And now both sleeve cap caps here, the cap on the sleeve itself and the cap of the big sleeve puff, are both gathered and both need to be gathered down and fit into the same armhole at the same time. So this is kind of the most nerve-wracking part of the whole bonus construction here. Uh, I mean, everything else, again, is rather straightforward if tedious. This is just, it's a battle. And you can see I'm double checking. I already put one sleeve in, so I'm using that as a reference to make sure I have all my notches and everything is in the same place so that I can gather everything out and fit it into here. And of course, this is the part where my camera had run out of battery. So now you can see what it looks like going in there, but it's like, there's nothing I could tell you that would make this any easier. It wasn't easy for me. And I have no tips other than like, hold your breath and hope for the best. Try and be patient with you. Be patient with the sleeve, you know, have grace. Um, it's going to be a time, but it's worth it for these giant sleeves. I promise. It doesn't feel like it in the moment, but it is. And of course I'm sewing over my pins here, which I highly recommend for something like this. Cause goodness, trying to do this and remove the pins as well. I don't know. It's just too much. And also refill or make sure your bobbin is in a good spot. I guess that's my only tip for this kind of thing. If you're about to sew a more difficult part of the project, it's the time you really do not want to run out of thread halfway through the seam, you know? So check your bobbin before you do something like this because you want to make sure you have enough thread. It's like running out of gas, you know? You just don't want it to happen to you when you're driving through the middle of the desert. Same sort of idea, you know? You really, this is the one spot you really don't want to get done and realize that you haven't done anything because actually there was no thread in the machine. So double check you have enough bobbin thread before you do something like this. And once my sleeves were all on, because things seemed to want to fray quite a lot, and I had several layers of fabric going on here, I did go ahead and just loosely whip stitch this as well. Um, just don't pull too tight, otherwise you'll make your armhole tighter and that will be uncomfortable to wear. But I just think it was worth it because there's a lot that wants to fray in here, and this is something that will perceive a lot of friction because my arm will be moving around down here. And I do still need to sew in um, like little sweat guards into the bottom of this, which at least, you know, that's easily interchangeable, whereas something like this isn't exactly washable <laughs> with all this silk. I This is not even dry clean only. It's just a, a spot clean or sew some beads over where you spill jam, that kind of a thing. Now with the sleeves on, we're so close to being, I'd say done, but um, ready to start embellishing. <laughs> not done. So I'm going to go ahead and mark every inch and a quarter up the front, center front of my bodice, and I'm going to sew on hooks and eyes. Again, I'm not worried about doing this in any particular special way because my stitches will show on the outside and it won't matter because again, the plastron will cover all of this. So I'm actually gonna sew a modern skirt hook on at the waistband of this just to really hold it secure. Got some cranberry juice, a belt, a beetle brooch, lipstick, all kinds of stuff going on here. Um, but I'm just sewing on a skirt hook and then hooks and eyes all down the front. I think it was about like 13 hooks and eyes. And now it's time to start making the plastron itself. And so I have uh, this pattern that was like my facing pattern from last time that I'm going to use as the basis for my plastron once again. 
And so it's just like the first three inches of my pattern traced. And then I drew on a lapel that I liked. I just freehand drew that the way I wanted it, honestly. I'm using the Truly Victorian bodice front as a guide. And then this will get sewn onto here and flipped over so that it looks like a lapel. Like it's a little faux jackety thing being worn over a blouse. I mean, all of these. Sometimes there are jackets being worn over blouses. Or like little um, dicky bib sort of things. Um, sometimes these are plastrons that are just worn over different garments. So you could have a black decorated plastron that you wore with your purple gown and with your green gown, you know. Trying to be versatile here. But mine will be sewn down to this bodice as part of the embellishment of this. And I have to do this center section and then the lapels. Because I decided to add that lapel on. In the center section, I'm going to actually use some black silk organza gathered up to create that so sort of fo faux blouse effect. Man, I cannot speak anymore. It may be time for more coffee. Actually, it's only time for lunch. Maybe I'll have coffee with lunch. Who knows? Keep me going here. I have spent a lot of nights the last few nights up till 1.30 a.m. beating. So, am I in my right mind anymore? The answer is absolutely not. And I was thinking, should I use some of this lace trim? I don't know. I can always add it on later, so keep that in mind. But now I have those lapels cut out of the graphite colored silk for a little bit of contrast, and I actually did end up using some lightweight interfacing on the like outside portion of these lapels just to help them stay super crispy and smooth, only because this taffeta was a little bit thinner than the other taffeta I was using. Um, this one is actually quite a lightweight taffeta. Um, I feel like my cicada gown, like the emerald color alphaba silk from Silk Baron was a little bit thicker than this. I don't know. It just seemed very lightweight, this taffeta. So I decided to reinforce the outside of the lapel. Once again, here I am trying to justify the things that passed me dead at midnight. Yeah. Who knows what she's up to? She's a wild one. But I will go ahead and line these with the same color silk. So I'm just creating these little funny little shapes. They almost look like a collar piece, but it's actually the funny little, again, sort of spiderweb or batwing inspired lapel. Again, as much Halloween as possible. How much can we pack in to this now Yuletide magical kind of gown? Oh well. <laughs> How did that happen to me? How is it, instead of Halloween, now it is Christmas? That seemed to happen to me as opposed to, um, you know, me noticing what was going on with the schedule. But this uh, plastron still needs to have a center front seam because, again, the center front of this is curvy, not straight up and down. Um, the kind of nice thing about 18th century sewing is, like, the center front seam is a straight line, usually, uh, for much of the 18th century because of the conical nature of stays. Um, but they do start to change shape in the 1780s, of course. But here we are, sewing around the edges again, again, leaving the needle down at any corner I come across, and I'm just leaving the part where this gets sewn onto the rest of the plastron open, but otherwise bag lining, I guess, um, facing my lapels. My faux lapels, as it were. I will go ahead and clip the curvy seam down the center of this cotton lining and the silk, mandragora silk layer of the center of the plastron here. It's kind of just making a very fancy bib, you know? And you'll see what I mean. And the nice thing about this is I'm going to very loosely stitch this onto this gown. If I wanted to change this out for a different embellishment later, I could. Totally. No problem. Um, so that was something that I think that the Victorians kept in mind. Retrimming gowns a couple of seasons later was not unheard of because, again, these things were incredibly expensive. Textiles are expensive now, but were a major investment. Like, that's kind of why, like, people had a trousseau, like, for their wedding and stuff like that. Like, this was a, like, the amount of textiles someone owned back in the, like, Tudor era and stuff like that was, like, an indicator of how wealthy they were. Um, and, like, for a long time was an indicator of how wealthy you were. And I guess having a ton of clothes still is an indicator of your wealth. Um, although with fast fashion and thrifting, you can have a lot of stuff without having to spend a ton of money, honestly. Um, but nowadays, I think having one or two very, very expensive things is considered, you know, fancy. But I, I would rather have a thousand pieces of costume jewelry than one diamond brooch. Gotta say. <laughs> and I have no diamonds, but I have many a rhinestone, as we know. I, d I see no use for real diamonds. For example, like a real diamond tiara. A couple thousand dollars at the very least, no? If not, several uh, tens of thousands of dollars. But think of how much costume jewelry you could have for that price. Or a car, you know? I just would rather have the fake stuff. It's just as pretty. Yeah. Maybe I'm just, you know, gauche or whatever it is and then with my center plaster on here i have just um, basted the two layers like flatline them together with the machine and then i'm starting to figure out okay how is this going to get go together this needs to be sewn right sides together 
with that single layer, just like kind of how I was finishing the collar earlier, and then turned to the other side and seamlessly finished on the inside. Or not seamless, there will be a seam, but uh, cleanly finished on the inside at least. So that will be like that. But before I can do that, I of course have to do the little chiffon layer here. And I am really making it up. Like I'm not going to pretend to you that any part of this plastron, I wasn't following any tutorial. I wasn't particularly looking at historical references. Um, as long as it looked historical in the end, I didn't care how it was done. It's just not my jam, as we know. But I bounded a, a length of silk here, about twice the width of my plastron, a little bit over that. And then I ended up hemming the top of this rectangle of silk and then gathering it down along the top um, before I started pinning it onto here. So let me go ahead and hem the top of this with a tiny little hem and then come back. So I've hemmed the top of my chiffon layer. I could have done that by hand, but I did it on the machine. Sorry, once again, if you're that close to me, you're too close. Um, and I'm just going to space out the gathers up here and pin this along the top of this as a starting point to see what we've got going on. Again, I've never done anything like th this before, so it's kind of just winging it. See if we can make it work. In the end, at this point, I'm thinking anything that goes wrong, I can just cover it in beads. And then at least it will be sparkly, no matter what happens, which is a way, one way to save things in my world. And I can go ahead and start pulling this and gathering it down at the bottom as well, just to see what kind of effect we're getting. If I was making something that was a little bit more turn of the century, um, or properly Edwardian, I would let this be poofier and like give it a bit of excess so that almost pigeon breasted uh, in the front, if you've heard of that term for Edwardian things. Um, but this, I'm just keeping it quite smooth just because we're still here in the 1890s and we haven't fully started doing that like blue, blouson, 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 whatever sort of French term you wish to use today. Um, sort of like droopy front was not in vogue just yet, I don't think so. We won't go too far with this. We'll keep it quite smooth. And I'm almost pulling it at a bit of tension here in the end. But I'm going to, again, base down the sides of this. Um, and then I can sew on those lapels. And here I am like holding it gathered and pinning it across the bottom, kind of holding it taut. And again, I will base it across the bottom of this once I have it positioned how I like. But this is more of a, uh, this is what I did as opposed to this is how to do it. I don't know how to do it, you know? At some point in the 1890s, they were making it up as they went as well. You know, they were just having fun with it, creating new ways to embellish things. There was about a bajillion different ways to decorate a gown. <laughs> during the Victorian times. So, I, especially during the 1890s, 1880s and 1890s, they really piled it on. So really you can get away with quite a lot of embellishing going on. If you wanted to pile some lace on top of this, underneath the sheer layer, actually putting beads on the under layer and then putting the sheer over it would have been really pretty because the sparkle would have been quite subtle through there. But one only has so many hours in a day and I didn't even finish completely beating this for this video. So I don't think I would have ever made it if I had done that. But I'm going to hand stitch this across the top because it is still just like pinned there. I'm going to hand stitch that. Just grab some silk thread again once again. Sometimes I grab fancy thread. Sometimes I grab poly thread. Who knows what I'm up to. What's the nearest black thread to me at any time? That's the one I grab. I'm just going to stitch this by hand across the top because these stitches will be slightly more visible again if you were quite close to me. Don't know why you would be there. Please stand at a certain distance. I would appreciate it. But once that is stitched down, I again can Kind of hem the sides of this plastron with my lapels here. So I'm just going to pin that right sides together. I want the interfaced side out because I wish for that to be the crispest and smoothest and have the most body to it, I suppose. Um, you could interline this with something a little bit more accurate than feasible interfacing, but you know, this is half accurate as usual with my things. I would like the overall effect, as I always say, this is what I always say about my costuming. If I were plonked down, if there was like a time travel moment and I was plonked down on the street in 1890. Well, I'd be bummed because my train would get really dirty, but um, I would not, I would wish to look not completely out of place. Like nothing about it would like really like scream this person is a time traveler to anyone walking by, you know, especially in this gown. It's still, everything visible is actually silk um, or cotton. There's no polyester fabric in this one, I don't think, other than again, the center lining. Um, but my last gown, the Moiré one, 100% polyester that bodice, other than the silk trimmings which may be a little unusual to the late Victorians, but would they really know what they were looking at? No, they didn't have plastics at the time anyhow, other than celluloid or vulcanite maybe. Vulcanite bottle stoppers. Again, just doing the same thing on the other side. And again, just turning the inside once this is sewn and 
whip stitching it down so that it's nice and smooth inside. Then I took a break from the plastron, mostly because I had just eaten dinner and I didn't want to try the bodice on. And to like position the plastron down the front where I wanted it, I would have to try my corset on and try the bodice on. And I had just eaten a big dinner. So I was gonna wait a couple of hours before I put a corset on. Just the way it is way of things. Sometimes you have to be a human being. It's a bummer for me. I really do find it disappointing. I wish I was some sort of a perfect robot, but sadly, uh, as much as I try, it is not the case. But I've made a bit of a template for the beading on the back of this, and so I'm just kind of following along my sketch here with some pins onto the silk, and then I can start sewing beads onto this. The way I'm going to be beading the majority of this whole thing is I'm just putting lines of beads down and then couching them down. Uh, the same way I was working on those uh, moths and beetles recently. I'm just doing a long thread of beads, and then I go along that uh, strip and then couch down with little stitches. So that's how I'm doing all of this bead work here. I'm thinking about, okay, where do I want these lines to be? I was trying to see if chalk would work on this, but nope. So I'm just going to use pins to, here are my size uh, nine check glass seed beads, by the way, for this in black that I'm using. But because this is rather an organic design, um, a spider web, I'm not super, you know, uh, going to be upset if the two sides don't match. Like it's almost better if they're not exactly the same. So I'm using a template for this side, but for the other side, I think I will kind of like just wing it now that I've done this one side um, as a starting point. But I'm just stitching down, you know, all these beads onto the surface. I'm, you know, making a stitch about every four beads unless it needs another one uh, to make sure that this is all couched down. And I'm sewing right through both layers into the inside. I actually saw a picture of a beaded garment from this time period where there were tons, hundreds of tiny stitches on the inside for stitching the embellishments on. So, you know, the inside of these is messy. I've had some people say, like, that's the reason I don't like historic costumes because the inside is so messy. I mean, you could fully bag line them when you were done, if you wanted to. It's actually not historically accurate to do so, which is funny. Every once in a while, you'll see like a really nice, like, cord dress or something like that, where they have lined it even in like a fine silk, which is very fancy. But again, I'm just like, I put the beads where I want them in one long string, and then I bring the thread up and couch them down. So here I'm doing another bit of spider web. Tried to leave in a little bit of this beading down here at the end so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm up to. This is the part that I still need to finish. I'm going to finish the spiderweb on this side of the back of the bodice, but I still have to finish the spiderweb on the other side. And I did stitch some beads down onto the collar. You can kind of see here, I have some uh, flat back, almost like, they're not rhinestones, they're black glass beads, and they're actually vintage. They're probably from like the 20s, maybe? Maybe a little bit earlier than that. I found them vintage online. And I have st um, stitched some seed beads along the outer edge of the collar as well up there just for funsies because you know if you're gonna have a villainous collar you might as well beat it with some teardrop beads and stuff as well you know add some sparkle and i will actually be adding some teardrops to this um or like drop mm, fringe yeah fringe sure we'll call it that that's kind of what it is uh you can see me anytime i need to move the needle at like a big distance instead of having stitches on the inside i just string it through the beads on the outside here so you can kind of see what that's what i was doing here but this is very similar to how i beaded the uh cicada gown evening bodice or um ball gown bodice if you've seen that i can put a card up to this that video here um so more beading in that usually in my life the beading is how spider webby can i make it because again as halloween as possible is the way to go and i just string on more and more beads onward and onward to go until i had the spider web finished and then I started doing the drops. So here I'm still working on the spiderweb. Again, you can see this long strand of beads here, and then I just hold it into the curve I want. And then coming up from the inside, I take little stitches over the strand of beads to couch it down flat against the rest of the bodice. Do try not to like, you know, change the fit of the pieces that you're working on. So like you're really almost looser is better than too tight when it comes to this kind of thing, because you don't want to misalign the actual bodice itself so that it doesn't fit anymore with having too tight of beading on it. Like if you imagine like, don't put like tight chicken wire around something that is supposed to be kind of flexible. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Nothing I say anymore makes any sense. Not even to me. Oh well. I did run out of black uh, tiny teardrop beads for this. So I started using the deepest, darkest garnet. So again, if you were far too close to me, you may be able to notice that the some of the teardrops in the back of this are darkest, darkest red if the light was shining just right. But that's okay. I don't mind having little drops of blood coming off of my spiderweb. It's a very Crimson Peak situation, is it not? And that is what inspired this costume in the first place, is that wonderfully decadent gothic costuming in that movie. And those giant sleeves that Mia got to wear for that, 
And I was like, well, I want giant sleeves, maybe. I didn't know if I would like them until I tried on that first muslin mock-up. And again, I was like, and I'm in love. Great. <laughs> there may be more 1890s things in my future. At least I'd have finished up that um, anthracite gown, as I called it last time. I'm not exactly sh sure on the name still. You all gave excellent suggestions. But um, I think I'm leaning towards the Whitby. The Whitby dress. Like Whitby Jet from uh, Whitby in the UK. Um, because it just sounds like, oh, what are you wearing tonight? Oh, I'm, I think I'll wear the Whitby. You know? I don't know. It sounds... It sounds like sort of like a speakeasy club or something. So I'm leaning towards the Whitby. Although anthracite is still anthro anth anthracite. Anthracite? Anthracite. Yeah, I can't say it. See, that's the problem. That's why I'm thinking the Whitby because it's easy for me to say. A lot of you were suggesting that um, Japanese technique of burning wood to give it that black effect, which first of all, can I have a house that is done that way? Yes, please. But I am not very good at pronouncing Japanese. So again, this is a problem. Or French, actually. We're still going. We're still beating. I have many more hours of this to do, let's face it, um, so I have to do the entire other side of this. This took me about, the amount of beating you'll see today took me maybe, let's say, four hours one night and then two days, so maybe like 12, like 16 to 18 hours of beating is what I put in on this so far. Uh, so, you know, I have a little bit <laughs> further to go. Um, two, uh, I finally tried on the dress <laughs> and pinned the plastron down on one side where I wanted it. Of course, this will overlap. And I think I'm just going to leave this end here kind of long and then tuck it up into the bodice because it works quite well like that. Fight me. I don't care, you know. Um, but I'm going to stitch this down. And if I'm going to stitch this down to the bodice, I might as well stitch it down with beads, you know, so that it has a little bit of sparkle going on here. So I have some oval-shaped beads. Then I have those same kind of flat back, crystally shaped beads and then seed beads. And I'm going to use these in an alternating pattern um, to sew this plastron down. I am sewing on the uh, edge, the inside edge of the lapel here, so that the outside edge of the lapel is free to mimic it being an actual lapel, like a turn back of a collar. Whereas, of course, it is all, all an illusion. But I will secure the plastron down with all of these beads, and then that will be me done for today. Um, unfortunately, I still have a lot of bead work to do, and then I have to still, I have this plastron pinned. <laughs> on the other side closed. I still have to attach a couple of hooks and eyes to the other side of the plastron. Of course, that doesn't get sewn down to anything. It's just free hanging so that it can flip over the center front closure um, just the same way that I did uh, the one for the last gown, the, the Whitby bodice from last time. Um, so same for the as I did it for the mock-up. I'm just showing a few more of the steps here because I was trying to be better. That's right. Even though my camera had died. And I was like, remember to film everything even though you're sad about your camera, please. And you can see all these little red pixels if you're looking closely, unless you're like watching on your phone. If you're watching this on your like HD television, I really do apologize. Um, but you're going to see lots of little broken pixels on this sensor because this is my oldest camera, the oldest camera that I have to work with. But, you know, the amount of setbacks going on here with this costume have been numerous, unfortunately, um, including my getting a cold in late October, which really was when I was planning on actually making this gown. But then I was in bed sick for several days, but at least it was just a cold. So I'm happy about that. Um, but it did set me back and completely throw off my schedule, sadly. But again, that's the last, this will be the last step for today. And I hope you enjoy seeing what the Mandragora bodice looks like finally with its matching skirt.
hope you all enjoyed seeing how most of this bodice came together. I am looking forward to finishing up the beading on this, putting on some podcasts or something, and just sitting here for another maybe day and a half or so. I think I have probably about another maybe six hours of beading to do on this, at least, perhaps, uh, just to really finish it up and finesse the beading on the back with the spider webs and all that jazz and the little dangles. So hopefully this will be fully finished soon here. And I also do want to make a couple of sash belts for this. So I might do a embellishing and belt like mini video sometime in the new year. Thank you so much as always to my patrons for making big projects like this possible. I could not continue my work without your support. So thank you so much. I hope you've all been having a good holiday season here and are staying safe out there. I will see you again here real soon. Bye.